I'll do this one a little bit different from some of our other studies. Before we get started, though, Ben, I didn't confirm with you. You have closing prayer tonight. Good to go. And Bob is back there. Good. Got it. Um, let me tell you something that I learned about Esther. And I don't even know where this came from or why I thought this in the first place, but forever, for as long as I've known anything about uh, the timeline of the Bible, I thought that Esther was the last book in the timeline. So you've got Haggai and Zechariah that talk about rebuilding the temple, and then Ezra and Nehemiah that talk about um, the restoration time, and Nehemiah comes back and rebuilds the walls, and then I had in my head, I, I, I would like to know where this came from. Who knows? That Esther was after that. Um, but uh, I, I did this. This is our timeline that we've been looking at. And so you've got the three steps that we just talked about down here. Rebuilding the temple, um, Ezra, and the things that he did. And notice the years. Ezra is at 458. Nehemiah rebuilds the walls in 444. But Esther is written at a time when she um, is uh, eventually connected to the Persian king Ahasuerus, which is almost certainly going to be Xerxes the first in, in, the, in the list. And so here's just a list of all the Persian kings. 539 is Cyrus the Great. That's kind of what we were talking about this morning in Bible class. Um, but look at this. Xerxes the first was 485 to 465. Um, which is going to put him, you know, even before the time of Ezra and some of the work that, that Ezra did. And so that's the reason why Esther's in the order that it's in and why I'm doing it at the end of the timeline. Because before I started reading and looking into Esther, I thought it went at the end of the timeline. But I guess that's a little bit out of whack uh, from where our study should be, but it shouldn't affect anything for what we're doing right now. As you get ready to study Esther and you open up maybe the heading above your, in your Bible above Esther where it says here's a little introduction to the book or if you have a study Bible or if you pick up a commentary, it seems like there's one thing across the board that everybody wants to talk about with Esther and that's a lot of the problems that come along with this book. And here's just one example of this. Interpreters throughout history have found the book of Esther to be a troubling presence within the canon of the Old Testament. It does not read like a religious text, and it's only linked to the rest of the Old Testament is that the story it tells involves the Jewish people. So this author is saying, here's what a lot of people have trouble with. The only reason that Esther looks like it belongs in the Bible is because it deals with Jews and the Jewish people from the Old Testament. Here's kind of a list of some of the top problems that people have with this. At the very top of the list, you're not going to find the name Yahweh or even the reference God in the book of Esther. And that's pretty troubling for a lot of people. And, and I think it's the basis for a lot of some of these other things that we're going to talk about as, as we look um, through the list. I'll tell you, though, um, Nathan Ward is a teacher at FC and a friend of mine who's done a lot of work in Esther. And he wrote a book that is his, his PhD dissertation in popular level book now that's out and the title is unseen god and it's kind of a play on this there's there's no mention there's no name yahweh or using the word god god did this god said this god showed this there's none of that in esther but that doesn't mean that he's not there as you go through esther and some of the things that we're going to look at tonight um, I think that you can see God. F for example, um, maybe one of the, the most popular verses um, of Esther, maybe one of the most famous verses of Esther, chapter 4 and verses 13 through 16. Uh, you will recognize this. Mordecai told them to reply to Esther. Do not think, this is what Mordecai says to Esther, don't think, 
to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise. Um, I'm sorry, I'm having some trouble with my words. If you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And so the thinking, Esther, listen, maybe this is the purpose of your whole life to be here at this moment in this place to help God's people survive during this time. Uh, It's implying God's presence. It implies that God put her there and that God is working a plan. And so I, I wouldn't get too excited about the name of Yahweh or the reference to God not being in the book. Um, So the whole book of Esther, I think one of the things that, I'm going to suggest this to you at the end of the lesson, my one sentence summary. The whole book of Esther basically leads up to tell, this is where the Jewish festival Purim comes from. And this is what it is, and this is why it exists. And so... You know, you've got Passover and Pentecost and the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles and all these things that come from the Law of Moses. And so one of the criticisms would be, well, the book of Esther exists to validate this feast that doesn't come from the Law of Moses. But neither does Hanukkah. And Jesus and his disciples are celebrating Hanukkah in the Gospel of John. And so I'm not sure that that's a really big one. One of the things that you're going to see at the end of this book when we get to chapter 9 is um, here is Haman who has created the situation where he's going to kill all of the Jews, genocide in in the empire. And Esther and Mordecai saved the day. And so their response is to say, let's kill all of our enemies. And so the criticism is, well, that's a pretty bloodthirsty, nationalistic kind of approach to things. And it might not sound very good, you know, to our ears to say, you tried to get me, so now I'm going to kill all you. Okay. But that's not really any different from anything else that we read in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is full of God saying, I will destroy my enemies. I will destroy your enemies and I will elevate you. And so You know, this is just the kind of thing. The Dead Sea Scrolls, the book of Esther is not currently found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. I say currently because, you know, who knows what will show up. But um, a lot of the things that you'll read about that, it wasn't, this is the only Old Testament book not represented among the Dead Sea Scrolls. And they say, because the name of God is not in there, and nobody really knows that. It's just a guess. There's no New Testament quotes or allusions to Esther. So what do we do with that? Anyway, um, that's just what you're going to see. If you're going to pick up something and you're going to read about Esther, there's a lot of attention devoted to these things. Maybe more attention to these things than anything else that, that I've read about. So I thought in an overview, that's probably something that you should know about. So here's what I told you earlier. I'm not going to do... A normal overview of Esther like we've been doing. Here it is up on the screen. You can see three basic sections of the book of Esther. It's too long to read the whole thing, so we're not going to read it. But the story is so basic and easy to understand that I don't even really need to summarize it. Just read it yourself. It's, you, you read it. It's just fine. Uh, there's not really any explanation necessary. In Esther chapter 1 and 2, the Persian king Ahasuerus has a wife named Vashti, and he says, hey, I want to show you off to all of my friends. And Vashti says, no, you're not going to show me off. So he kicks her out, and he's going to need a replacement. And so Esther becomes that replacement. That's how Esther comes to be married to the Persian king. In chapters 3 through 8, there's a man named Haman who is full of pride and arrogance. And he really cannot stand Mordecai because Mordecai does not give him the attention that he thinks that he deserves. And so he's going after Mordecai. And because of this, he's going after the Jewish people. But this is the unseen God part of the book where 
God really flips this on his head, which we've seen all throughout the Bible that God does this. And so uh, the tables are turned. Haman is the bad guy who goes after the Jewish people, and Haman ends up getting hung on his own gallows that he built for Mordecai and uh, the enemies of God's people perish. Chapter 9, look at Esther chapter 9 with me. We'll read this section, maybe verses 1 through 3. Um, now in the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar, on the thirteenth day uh, of the same, when the king's command and edict were about to be carried out, on the very day when the enemies of the Jews hoped to gain the mastery over them, the reverse occurred. The Jews gained the mastery over those who hated them. The Jews gathered in their cities throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, to lay hands on those who sought their harm. And no one could stand against them, for the fear of them had fallen on all peoples. Um, also, I think that's God in that verse. That's how God works in military terms in the Old Testament. The fear of the Jewish people come on the people so that the, the Jewish people are victorious. Verse 3, all the officials of the provinces and the satraps and the governments and the royal agents also helped the Jews for the fear of Mordecai had fallen on them. And so here is this thing that happens. And the ultimate point of all of this is that there's going to be a holiday called Purim to memorialize this victory of the Jewish people when we're saved and when we were victorious over our enemies. And, and so the book of Esther tells us about how we get that holiday and where it comes from. So that's really the only overview of Esther that I intend to do tonight. What I want to spend my time on tonight are two lessons that come from Esther that are just really, really important lessons for life. They're good in the book of Esther, but also they're good for life. So turn to chapter 3 and verse 1. In Esther chapter 3 and verse 1, we're introduced to the bad guy. After these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman the Agagite. Um, I think I've not found any reason to think otherwise. I think that across the board, everybody makes a big deal out of this guy, Haman, being an Agagite, which... That might sound to you like an Agagite. That's Ryan saying it as if I should know something about this, but uh, maybe for at least some of you, it doesn't just come straight to the front of your mind. So let's do a little bit of history. Go to Exodus chapter 17. We're going to go all the way back to when the Jewish people are coming up out of their Egyptian slavery. In Exodus chapter 17... Starting in verse 8, Amalek, um, the Amalekites, are the very first people to attack the Jews coming out of Egypt on their way to the promised land. And so verse 8 is where this story starts. Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. And this is the story where as long as Moses held up his hands, Israel was victorious against Amalek, but his hands got tired, and so Joshua and Hur came and held up his hands for him. That's the story that we're reading right now. Jump down to chapter 17 and verse 14. The Lord said to Moses, Write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. So here we are leaving slavery under God's commands on the way to the promised land. And Amalek has come out to fight against us. And God says, write this down. Amalek is donezo. I am not going to allow this group of people to exist and to continue because of what they've done. So turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 25. You'll see another one of these references. Deuteronomy 25 and verses 17 through 19. Remember now Deuteronomy is at the end. Exodus 17 is at the beginning of the 40 years of wandering. 
Deuteronomy is at the end of this 40 years. They're getting ready to go into the promised land. And this is what God says. Remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you came out of Egypt. How he attacked you on the way when you were faint and weary and cut off your tail, those who were lagging behind you. And he did not fear God. Therefore, when the Lord your God has given you rest from all your enemies around you, in the land that the Lord your God has given you for an inheritance to possess, you shall blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. You shall not forget. That's going to be one of my main points here to think about what we're doing here with this story. We're 40 years after the event. And God is still talking about it. When you go into the land and you have everything done that you need to do to live in the land peacefully... Don't forget to do this thing and wipe out Amalek because of what they did. And this is going to be the point. This is the thing that I'm coming to. Decisions for all people in all circumstances always have consequences. Always. And so here is Amalek who made a choice and God doesn't forget. They're going to have to pay the price. And I'm sure because all of this time and all of these generations have passed... That they probably feel like, oh, I don't know, maybe God forgot or maybe we don't have to pay the price. No, you're going to have to pay the price. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 15. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, we have gone at this point all the way through Joshua and the conquest of the land. We've gone all the way through the judges. And now we have Saul, who is the first king of Israel. In 15 and verse 1, Samuel said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people Israel. Now therefore listen to the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I have noted what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came up out of Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. We're like 400 years after the fact at this point. And God has remembered what he said during the Exodus. Uh, and so he sends Saul to do the job. Verse 8 is why we're looking at all of this history in all of this story. Saul goes, it says, and he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and devoted to destruction all the, the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and the oxen, the fatted calves and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. All that was despised and worthless, they devoted to destruction. Um, do you remember how Haman... And the book of Esther is called an Agagite. I don't know how he's connected to Agag in this story. But I, I, think, I think that it's pretty certain that he is. Because if you'll go back to Esther chapter 2 and verse 5, maybe, maybe this is just some sort of a... Um, a literary tool? I don't know. Maybe he is actually physically connected by lineage to Agag. But in Esther chapter 2 and verse 5, it says, Now there was a Jew in Susa, the citadel, whose name was Mordecai. Now listen to Mordecai's genealogy. The son of Jer, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjaminite. You remember Saul was the son of Kish, a Benjaminite. And here is Mordecai, a descendant of Kish, a Benjaminite, whose enemy that he's going to fight against is Haman, an Agagite. Um, and so there's two things about this that I would, I would say, uh, just as a, as a lesson that, that we think about this. Number one, besides the things up there, you can read that. That stuff for yourself. Number two on the, on the list up there. This is the first thing. Saul didn't do what he was supposed to do. God said, I need you to completely destroy the Amalekites. To 
kill Agag, Agag the king, all the people, everything. He didn't do it. And here we are now, what? Um, Saul comes at about a thousand, ten fifty. Um, and where are we? We're in the four hundreds at this point. So now we're six hundred years away from Saul. And the consequences of Saul's disobedience is still haunting the people of God. This is the only thing that I want to say about that. As I say, the only thing I want to say about that, but I don't want to make light of it because this is something we should probably consider. The decisions that we make now, everyday decisions, those choices are going to have consequences. And you might feel like knowing good and well that you've made a sinful choice or a bad decision, you might feel like you got away with it and you're not going to get caught and there's not going to be any consequences. But this story ought to teach us clearly, without exception, there are always consequences, always. And they may not even come in your lifetime. And it's not overly comforting to think, well, you know, at least I don't have to suffer the consequences of my decision. My grandkids are going to have to suffer the consequences of my decision. Well, I'm sorry about that to my grandkids. I don't want that to happen. But there's a million illustrations that, that I think of when, when we talk about this one. And I don't want to go through the full list of illustrations, but there's one that just seems to pop up again and again and again. It's the story of a Christian who is like you guys, a young person who's raised in a faithful family, faithful people of God doing what you're supposed to do. And they grow up and maybe make it through high school and go off to college and they're not in their parents' house anymore. And then they fall away and they leave the Lord. They get married and make a bad choice of a spouse they're not faithful, so they're not caring about faithful things. And um, they have kids, and the kids start to get a little older. And something from your past and your conscience starts to ring in the back of your head, and you think, I need to raise my kids to know the Lord. Um, and so, at some point, this person decides, it's time for me to come back and to start serving God. But your spouse that you found who has never cared anything about God, doesn't want any part of it. And your kids who have lived for however long in the unfaithful house that you've raised them in, they don't care anything about spiritual things now. And so you repent and you come back to the Lord and it's good. And God accepts repentance and he brings us back in. But now you've raised an entire family, an entire generation of people who don't care anything about God. And, and that is, that's the, the prototypical picture in my head of what this looks like. Our decisions always have consequences. Always. Saul didn't do what he was supposed to do. And it haunted the Jewish people for hundreds of years down the road. The other side of the story is it's... Never too late to turn back and to start doing the right thing. Saul, the son of Kish, a Benjaminite, failed to take care of Agag. But Mordecai, the descendant of Kish, a Benjaminite, stepped up and did what Saul should have done in the first place. Do that. It's never too late to start doing the things that we should do. So point number one. Um, Haman was an Agagite. I think it's a good lesson from Esther. There's always consequences. And this is something that I tell Luke over and over again. You don't have to believe me. I don't care. Everybody always gets caught. Always. There's never a situation where somebody doesn't get caught. That's, there's always consequences. Okay. Number two. One of the things that people have against the book of Esther is that Esther and Mordecai are kind of shady characters, especially at the start. If you will pay attention, um, I mean, Mordecai kind of sets her up in this situation. He says, hide your identity. Don't tell anybody that you're a Jew. And she goes in and she pleases 
the Persian king more than all of the other virgins that he's been test driving to see who's going to be his next wife. And he chooses Esther. Uh, there's a lot of questionable stuff going on here. And so, you know, we might say, I'm not quite sure about the book of Esther because they don't really seem, at least at the start of the book, to be great people. But I, I got to give credit where credit is due. This point came straight from Nathan Ward in a lecture that he did at FC in 2014, I think. So this is not me coming up with this. I don't want you to think that, that I am. But maybe what we need to pay attention to with Esther is not where she is at any point in the book, but the development and the progress of her character over time. And that's going to mean something for us, I think. The first thing is that she starts off passive. Look at chapter 2. I'll give you an example of what I mean by uh, she starts off passive. In chapter 2, starting in verse 5, Esther doesn't do anything to anyone. Things happen to her. She is the recipient of everybody else's choices and everybody else's actions. So verse 5, there was a Jew in Susa the citadel whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jer, the son of Shimei, son of Kish, a Benjaminite, who had been carried away from Jerusalem among the captives, uh, carried away with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away. He was bringing up Hadassah, that is Esther. So there's another thing that's a little bit questionable, you know. Her name is Hadassah, but we know her as Esther. She's adopted her Persian self, her Persian identity. The daughter of his uncle, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman had a beautiful figure and was lovely to look at. And when her father and her mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So when the king's order and this edict were proclaimed, and when the many young women were gathered in Susa, the citadel, the custody of Haggai, Esther also was taken into the king's palace and put into custody of Haggai. And you just, you read the whole story and everything is happening to her. She's a passive character who just does what, what happens to her. But then you have this transition in chapter four and the transition is Mordecai saying to her, hey, now it's time for you to do what God put you here for. This is time for you to be the person that you're supposed to be. Who knows? Maybe you've been brought for such a time as this. And so in chapter 4 and verse 14, now from this point forward, she becomes active. She's no longer the recipient of other people's actions. She is the one doing the action. So 414, if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise from the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, go, here she is. Now she's doing the same, the action. Go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf. Hey, also more God. What are you fasting? You're going to God. It's prayer and fasting. There's God. She says, this is what I want you to do. Hold a fast. On my behalf, do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, uh, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Um, and so she does. Here is uh, this action that she takes. She tells other people what to do. Have a fast. Say a prayer. I'm going to go to the king. That's what she does in chapters 5 through 7. She makes a plan. She executes it flawlessly so that it works out. And so she's gone from passive to active. And then finally, at the end of the book, she is an authority figure. Um, look at chapter 8 and verses 1 and 2. On that day, King Ahasuerus gave to Queen Esther the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told what he was to her. And the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai. And Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman. Turn over to chapter 9 and verses 29 through 32. 929. 
Then Queen Esther, the daughter of Abihel, and Mordecai the Jew gave full written authority confirming the second letter about Purim. Letters were sent to all the Jews to the 127 provinces of the kingdom of Ahasuerus in the words of peace and truth. And she says, this is what we're going to do. We're going to have Purim. And it's according to her word. It's according to her authority that this thing happens. And so here's something to consider. Just about the way that it flows. And how Esther goes from questionable and shady to a godly leader who does godly things for God's people. When we think about faithful heroes in the Bible, I think a lot of times, my head anyway, goes to, wow, Daniel. I mean, here is a guy who has all of his ducks in a row and always has. This is a faithful servant of God. But Daniel's a person just like the rest of us, with flaws just like the rest of us. And I think that's what you see with Esther. You see a person that we don't look at and we say, a Bible hero with top-notch spiritual character. What you see is a person who starts at one point and develops over time in order to become what God would have her to be. And so two things about that, and then we'll wrap this lesson up. Number one, I hope that that's you. I hope that that's us. That I hope that you're not the same Christian that you were last year or five years ago or ten years ago. I hope that you're better and farther down the road and that there is some sort of progression and development of your character so that week after week and year after year and decade after decade of your Christian walk, you're getting better and better and better ultimately to be more like Christ in the way that you live. And so this picture of character development, let's do that. A uh, second thing that goes with character development. How about we treat each other like that? Um, how many adult Bible classes have you taught? Is this your second one? Have you done other ones in other times, places? A couple other ones before, but still not very many. You're starting to teach an adult Bible class. I know you're not young, but you're younger, you know, and you're starting out in this teaching capacity and all this, and I know that you'll do perfectly fine. Um, but this is just an illustration. It's not going to be fair or right to judge Adam uh, with the same standards that you would judge me in teaching a class. And that's just a class illustration. It's not going to be fair or right to look at a person who's newer in the faith or who's had a slow start in their development as, as a Christian and to, to judge them in the same way that you would judge Ed, you know, who's been practicing being a Christian for a long time and he's really good at it so far as, so far as any of us are able to tell. Um, I've had this path of growth and development and I'm grateful that people have been patient with me. How about we be patient with each other? And when you read the book, don't just say, wow, Esther sure was a shady person doing bad things at the start of the book. That's true, but let's acknowledge how she grew and do that ourselves and be patient with each other as we're all growing and developing in our faith over time. The one sentence summary of Esther is not very exciting. Um, the book of Esther explains the origin and authority. Uh, the authority is the unseen God part. I thought I'd put that in there. The origin and the authority for the Jewish Purim festival. This is what the festival is. This is why we do it. And this is where it came from. <clears throat> if you are here tonight and you're not a Christian, I'll say one last thing and then, and then we'll have our invitation. One of the things that often holds people back from becoming a Christian is someone who says, I know I'm not going to be perfect and I'm going to continue to make mistakes. Hey, that's all of us. Even still. 
But the lesson from Esther is that you got to start somewhere. And so if you're ready to start and you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and you're ready to repent and turn away from your sins, to die to yourself, be buried in the waters of baptism, when you come up out of the grave to say, I'm ready to start trying. We know you're not going to be perfect, but you're ready to start trying. We'd love to help you with that tonight. Come forward, make your needs known as together we stand and sing the invitation song.